Hey, that's not it. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. I mean, and this whole series is about motivate, right? And how much would, would Mr. Richard not appreciate it if we were not motivated? Is that right? I mean, isn't he the king of motivation? So can we have some music? Every time we touch, I get there we go. Come on. Come on. Yeah, come on. Get it on. Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I can't dance like Richard Simmons. But maybe we can get some motivation in here. I don't know. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, I I'm just going to stop now before I get myself in trouble and get you in trouble, too. But uh, <clears throat> I, I just have one question. I was gone for two weeks. What has happened to this place that you would literally stand up and dance? What is wrong with you people? Right? <laughs> you like the boogie. So uh, maybe we'll see uh, Richard Simmons interview somebody else. But uh, I, I love, uh, outside of that, I uh, uh, love... Uh, story of Richard and how God is uh, changing his life and I know that his life is not the only one and uh, that's what we want to try to capture is uh, how God is changing the lives of people so I mean, we can show up here every week and uh, <clears throat> listen to uh, to God's word being taught and uh, we can worship through through song but uh, if it's not impacting our lives then I honestly don't see the point uh, so I, I'm always encouraged to hear stories from uh, from Richard and uh, I, I'm always excited to meet a famous person like Richard Simmons, too. Um, I, uh, I've been uh, out for the last uh, two weeks. Um, it was nice to, uh, to get away with family, uh, to spend time with family. Uh, and I, I realized the need for that. Uh, actually, last night when uh, my, uh, <clears throat> my, my youngest daughter is uh, just turned three, Caden, she had a little bruise on her head. And my wife asked her, she said, hey, what happened to your head? Are you okay? And, um, you know, Caden's like, uh, not really listening, paying attention. And then my wife says, uh, just jokingly, how does the other guy look? And uh, my daughter proceeds to say, super cute, mommy. <laughs> and so right at that point, it's like, yes, I need to be home. <laughs> I need to keep those super cute boys away from my, my girls. But uh, I, uh, I appreciate uh, just, yeah, just time to be able to be gone for a couple weeks, enjoy family, a little bit of the sun. Uh, obviously, I didn't bring that back with me, but uh, who knows, maybe it'll show up tomorrow. You're welcome. But I did bring Richard. Um, we've been going through this series, Motivate, and the whole point, the whole, the whole premise behind this series is we want to help give you maybe lack of a better term, tools that you can take and apply to, to your own life. Uh, we, scripture says that we want to grow to a place in our lives where we are no longer babies in the faith. Um, you know, we're no longer needing somebody to give us a pacifier. We're no longer somebody that needs to give us a, a bottle. But you know, think about if you have babies at home. Do you want that baby? I have a baby at home. I'm a little scared. To be 18 still drinking from the same bottle. <laughs> I certainly don't. I'm hoping 18 he's out the door, right? Um, but uh, the way that happens is for us to grow in our walk with Christ. It's for us to be given some tools that we can take to apply to our own growth. I can't make you grow, you know, um, as much as I can make my grass at home stop growing so I don't have to mow it. And so this whole series is designed to look at eight different stories out of Scripture. And through those stories, we've, we've told you there's five things that we believe marks maturity in somebody's life. Do you guys remember what those are? Come on, you got to help me out. What are those? Just yell them out. Richard would be proud. Identity. Identity is one. We're going to talk about that today. What else? Discipleship. Discipleship is one. Yes. How are you investing your life into other people? Right? What else? 
gospel and mission. You know, and we talked about this uh, in our community group. If you're not in a group, I'd really encourage you to jump into a group. You want to talk about a place that you grow. Uh, the idea that, you know, the Father has sent Jesus and Jesus now sends us. I mean, that's the gospel, right? Uh, what else? There's two more. Character. character is one. Godly character, because some of you guys are just characters. And uh, what's the fifth one? Spiritual disciplines. You know, and that's just developing habits in our lives where we allow God to speak to us and we speak with God, right? We're going to talk about that a little bit today too, I guess. But today, as we continue through this series, um, the idea of identity, uh, I want to look at 850 B.C., before Christ, not before children. Um, 850 B.C. And you, you see a, a guy come on the scene. Well, during that time, you've got this king. His king the king's name is Ahab. Can you say King Ahab? He was a wicked dude. He was just terrible. I don't mean, mean wicked as like some of the kids might throw around. Man, that was just totally wicked. I don't mean that. I mean this dude was like a bad, 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 bad dude. And he was leading the nation of Israel, right? The nation of Israel. It's talked about in the uh, first Kings. You can read it. And as he's leading the nation of Israel, there's an empire up north of them. So think of Canada being this amazing empire. And, and they, they want to come down and conquer. The Assyrians want to come down and conquer. And so what is a great military strategy back in that day? You know, there's a, a kingdom kind of next to Israel. And King Ahab says, man, that kingdom, if we kind of united, maybe we could fend off this Assyrian empire to the north, right? And he looks and he says, that person that's leading that, that empire, that kingdom, is a lady named Jezebel. Anytime you hear the name Jezebel, throw up question marks. And he says, man, Jezebel, if we, you know, maybe get married, probably not a good reason to get married. But if we get married, we can unite our kingdoms. Maybe we'll have a bigger force, right? And so everybody looked at King Ahab and they said, man, this guy's brilliant. He not just merged two kingdoms, but he just married this hot chick from, uh, from the kingdom to the, to the left, right? And so they're looking and they're saying, man, he's a great strategist. He's a, he's a great king. Lord, thank you for a great king. Well, there was a problem, right? The problem was that when you bring a wicked king together and you bring a wicked uh, queen together, what, what do you get? It's not like a positive and negative cancel each other out and you get zero, right? That's a bad engineering joke. Um, you get wicked and wicked, you get doubly wicked. And so now this is like worse off than it was before. And now you start seeing, even though their numbers may be strong, you see the foundation and the core of the Israelite people start to crumble. Because as Jezebel comes in, she brings her gods with her, right? And you know who her gods were. I don't know if it changes much between then and now. Her gods were Baal, who was the god of prosperity. He was the god of lightning, the god of weather, the god of the sun and the rain, right? And when you look at the weather elements, that is what brought prosperity to a land, right? And so he was the god of prosperity. And so she kind of brings that god in and says, ah, I think we need to worship the god of Baal. And who, who would... Who would Say, you know, somebody comes in, I want you to worship the God of prosperity. Uh, I, I'm in. And then she says, but there's another God, maybe even better. And uh, that God is Ashtara. And it was kind of the female counterpart to Baal. And so she's calling the nation to worship a God of prosperity. And she's calling the people to worship the God of fertility. I won't go any further into examples with that. I think we can all understand. And so think about it. If the kingdom now is telling the Israelite people, you should be worshiping the God of prosperity, and you should be worshiping the God of fertility, 
I mean, come on. How many of us would have a hard time saying, I'm not in? Just look at our culture. Don't we worship the God of prosperity? Look at the movies, the news. Don't we worship the God of fertility? So I don't think there's much difference between the crumbling of the kingdom back in 850 B.C. and the crumbling of a nation in 2014. But God sends in a guy named Elijah. Can you say Elijah? God sends this man in, and he tells him, he says, I want you to go in, and I want you to speak boldly to King Ahab. Think about if you were given this mission. Think about this. Put yourself in this place. He tells him, he says, go in, and I want you to tell the king, tell King Ahab that it is not going to rain for three and a half years. Now, I, think about this. I love how God works. And people say God doesn't have a sense of humor, right? I love how God works. How does God choose to intervene in the situation? Think about this. They set up Baal, the God of prosperity, of what? The weather, the rain, the sun, the lightning, and the God of fertility. And God chooses to come in and say, oh, you, oh, you think that that is the God of prosperity. You think that's the God of the rain. Oh, man, I'm going to show you something really funny. Hey, Elijah, go tell them it is not going to rain for three and a half years. So Elijah comes in and he sits down with King Ahab and he says, you know, you have, you have disgraced the ultimate God. You've allowed these other gods into your life. And because of that, the one true God has said, it is not going to rain for three and a half years. And you know what he tells Elijah? God tells Elijah, after you tell him that, run and hide. Now, wait a minute. I, at that point, I'd be like, wait a minute, God. You're sending me to give this message to this wicked king who just married this wicked chick, and now it's like doubly wicked going on in this state. And you want me to deliver this message? And the only thing you tell me afterwards is to run and hide? I'd be like, God, wait a minute. I thought you were going to protect me. And God says, well, yeah, if you can run really, really fast and hide really, really good, I'll protect you. I mean, that's amazing. Think about it. Get that. It's amazing. You see, it's, if you look at the, the situation going on here, I, I think there's, there's great evidence within, within a people. You see a people that at one time worshiped the one true God, right? And now all these kind of other things come in, these other distractions. You have the God of prosperity, the God of fertility. I don't think we're much different today. I think we have the God of prosperity, the God that I call, some of us have the God of the boob tube TV. Some of us have the God of my car. Some of us have the God of my house. Whatever it is that we hold in higher esteem to the one true God. The thing that is interesting, if you understand the Israelite people, think about this culturally, just with me for a second, track with this. The people that, that are talked about here in the Old Testament scriptures, culturally, they worshiped one God, right? And Elijah comes in and he's speaking into that. Because culturally, they didn't allow a fragmented life, okay? For a Jewish person, back in this time, everything was centered around one thing. And it was centered around the concept that there was one God, so it wasn't like there's a God for this or a God for that. And, and a lot of times we don't even have to name those gods, honestly. 
Because if you look in a culture, if, you, if we are a culture that says, well, there could be multiple gods, what does that do? Where does things center around? It doesn't allow anything to center around anything, right? And, and so if we say there's multiple gods, or some of us, maybe, maybe we would say verbally there is one God, but we would act as if there's multiple gods that are kind of ruling my life. Where does everything center around? There has to be something. Right? And that's what's amazing about what is transpiring in this text as well. Kind of in behind the scenes, culturally, if you will. And so uh, if you turn to 1 Kings chapter 18, I've summarized part of the story, another part of the story I would love for us to read and to take a look at. So Elijah walks on the scene again. He shares there's not going to be rain three and a half years. He runs really, really fast, really, really hard, and he hides very, very well for three and a half years. And then if you pick up the story in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, it's uh, for some of us <clears throat> that are still learning how to uh, get around in the scriptures, uh, that is A OK. -OK. You know, you've got five books. Uh, you'll find Deuteronomy as being the fifth book from the beginning. Then you get into Judges. Then you get into kind of all those first and second books. Uh, first and second Samuel. And then you get into first and second Kings. And we're going to camp in uh, chapters 18 and 19. Uh, starting there in verse 16, it says, um, <clears throat> God then comes back and he tells he tells Elijah, he says, hey, it's been three and a half years. Great job hiding and running. Now it's time to come out into the forefront. And I've got another message for you to deliver. Can you imagine being Elijah at this point in time? Think about it. Um, you want me now to come out and give permission for it to rain? Do you know what they might do to me? Anyways, he takes the challenge. He goes out and says, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah because what happens here is uh, Elijah goes and he finds a guy named Obadiah. And uh, Obadiah was like one of the few people in the kingdom that still followed the one true God. One of the people in the kingdom that still said, I, 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 I have held true to my God. So he didn't follow the nation away, worshiping the God of uh, prosperity and the God of fertility. And, uh, and Elijah finds Obadiah and says, hey, it is time. I need to speak to the king. If you read through that text, it, uh, Obadiah, he's, uh, before that he says, I, I don't want to do that. If I go tell the king that you're here and you want to speak to him, he is going to be peeved. Okay? He's not going to be a happy camper because you disappeared for three and a half years. The God that they have raised up has not brought any rain for three and a half years. Crops are dying. People are starving. He's not going to be happy to see you. If I go to him and tell him you're back, it could be my head. Elijah convinces Obadiah to go. And picking up in verse 16, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Picture that. How hard do we need to be? How hard does King Ahab need to be for three and a half years? He, he's not at a place of saying, oh, man, three and a half years, um, no rain. Uh, man, this guy's really failing us. Uh, man, maybe I made a mistake. You don't see that. You don't, you don't see him saying, oh, man, maybe, maybe we should change things up a bit here. Uh, hey, Jesse, this ain't working too well. You don't see any of that. He comes and he says, Elijah, it's your fault. You troubler. And he says, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal 450 prophets of Ashura 
who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets of Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? He's telling the people, the nation, that have followed these false gods, How long will you waver in your unbelief? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And I love this. It says, But the people said nothing. It, there were crickets, hands in their pockets. They didn't want to say anything. I don't know what's going on. Is there conviction? Wow, man, maybe, maybe we did mess up. Is there anger? I just don't want to talk about this. Well, they, uh, <clears throat> they gather up on the mountain. And picture this, 450 prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Asherah, right? Asherah. And so that's 900, in case you might struggle with math. 900 people. And then you've got one dude that ran really, really well and hid very, very well against 900 people. And he's standing there. And he's got a plan. He says, hey, you know what? Let's just settle this thing once and for all. Can you imagine? Put yourself in that place. You're on top of this mountain. You know God. You've heard from God. You've, you, you've talked with God, right? You know God is real, that there is one true God. You're standing there, and there's 900 prophets that want to see you done away with because they're tired of your, your antics. You have not allowed it to rain for three and a half years. And you boldly look at those 900 prophets, and you say, hey, guys, let's do a little contest. I mean, I'll even give you home court advantage. We're up on this mountain. Your God is Baal, the God of weather. Let's just set up an altar. And, and we'll slice up some beef and we'll throw it on the altar. And we'll just ask your God to bring, to bring fire down from heaven and, and burn this offering. And so the text says that they did. They built this huge altar sliced up some beef, they threw it on there, and then they like danced around, and they, they prayed, and they sung, and they were intense in their worship. But their worship was misplaced. And it says that they started cutting themselves and saying, bring fire down. And then Elijah's standing over here, picture this, like all day this is transpiring, Elijah's just like, And he notices nothing's happened all day. And so he looks at him and he says, hmm, I don't know, man. Maybe, you're, maybe your God's having a bad day. You know, you know, maybe your God's not listening. Do it do a little bit louder. Right? He waits a little bit longer. And then he says, I don't know, man. And this is true. Look in the text, the original text. I know what it is, guys. Your God is on the pot. And he's a little busy right now. He's like, call back later. It's there. It's in the text, honestly. And keep, imagine being Elijah, the boldness it takes for one man to speak this to, to all these lunatics running around this altar worshiping something that isn't there. I wonder how many times I've run around an altar worshiping something that wasn't there. For a long time I did. A long time. And then one day God grabbed a hold of me and he said, Hey, hey, hey your, your God's on the pot. <laughs> he ain't going to do a whole lot for you, Mike. And God got my attention. The one true God got my attention. And so this goes on all day. And then Elijah says, Hey, now it's my turn. <clears throat> now it's my turn. And uh, it says, uh, verse 31 of chapter 18, Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. It says, with these stones, so he took these stones representing the foundation that had been laid before. Amazing. 
with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two, <clears throat> two seas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. So he gets bold, he gets brave. He says, let's just not make it dry, let's make it drenched. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water's running all over this altar, right? At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and he prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil. Everything flew up in the flames. Everything went up in the flames. And that day on Mount Carmel, Elijah did something miraculous, right? That day on Mount Carmel, <clears throat> Elijah showed an intensity that is uncomparable as you read through the pages of Scripture and the stories that God has left for us, right? On Mount Carmel that day, you see the power of God rain down on this altar, burn up this altar that has been drenched with water. You see that day, all of these false prophets praying and worshiping and prophesying and asking this false God to bring fire down and nothing happens. And Elijah the whole time is standing there watching nothing happen. Then he comes in and he builds his own, calls fire down and poof, it goes up in smoke. Now, some, some of you know that story, right? Some of you may have sat in Sunday school as a kid and you've heard that story. Some of you may have heard other, <clears throat> other people share that testimony out of Scripture, right? But I think there's a part of that story that we sometimes leave out. Because, I mean, it's exciting to look at this, right? I mean, we look and we see a powerful God. We look and we see a confident person. We look and we see somebody that knows his identity, right? He knows who he is. He knows whose he is. And he does what has been called to do, right? So we love that story because it just marks confidency. It just marks a guy that is secure, a guy that knows. But we don't look at the story that comes after Because what comes after is what we've titled the message today, and it's the mountaintop drop. What comes after is a man that we see at the lowest point in his life. Coming off of this mountaintop experience, and we find him at the lowest point in his life. And I wonder if sometimes we don't want to talk about that because it's much more fun to talk about the confidence and the perseverance and, and just the, that idea of being on the mountain. Because I think sometimes we don't know what to do after the drop. I want to show you in chapter 19, one of the lowest places that anybody can be in their life. And this comes on the tail of one of the greatest and powerful experiences in all of history. Chapter 19, verse 1. Ahab runs back and he tells Jezzy. He tells her everything that Elijah has done. And she, being in charge of all these prophets... And oh yeah, by the way, at the tail end of all that, Elijah ordered all those prophets to be done away with. And so these were her prophets. And so Ahab comes back and he tells his wife, he says, this is what happened today. And Jeze, Jezebel, she, she pulls up to her vanity. 
And she's looking in the mirror and she's like, oh, this is not going so well. What do I do? What do I do? I know what I'll do. I'm tired of that fool. So she pulls out a post-it note and she writes on there, uh, Elijah must die. Here, go do this. Take care of this. And then it says uh, in verse 2, so Jezebel sent a messenger to, to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them that you had done away with. Elijah was afraid. It says he ran for his life. So he remembers running really, really hard and trying to hide very, very well, right? When he came to Beersheba and Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. He says, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay there under the tree, and he fell asleep. Help me out here. Can, can, can you help me? I'm trying to understand. How? Think of this. Take, take this off the page of the text, okay? Put this in actual, this is an actual occurrence that has happened, okay? Mount Carmel is an actual place, okay? I've, I've been there. How, how do you go from a place where one day you're calling fire down from heaven and you're having a good old time to a place where a sticky note drives you to the point of suicide? Isn't it amazing? One person one person, it says, wrote that. One person. One person thought this about Elijah. One person threatened this. Isn't it amazing how much power one person has? I mean, one person and how many billions of people may write you a note tomorrow, may send you an email tomorrow, and it wrecks your week. How much power does one individual have? It, 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 it goes on, <clears throat> and it says, all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time, and he touched him, and he said, Get up, eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, ate, and drank, strengthened by the food. He traveled 40 days, 40 nights, until he reached uh, Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went to a cave, and he spent the night. There are, uh, I, I wanted to take a moment this week, and I, I heard these things from somebody else, and I thought, man, this is powerful, and I wanted to share these with you, because you have to look and you say, okay, where does disappointment come from? How do we go from this mountaintop experience? And we can all look through our life and find mountaintop experiences, Right? I mean, you may have had one this week. But oftentimes there's, there's, a, there's a hill on the other side and it takes us down into this valley. And so the question is, what is it that draws us into that place? What is it that pulls us off of that mountain? Right? And, and, and so this is what I, I, I heard. One of the things is difficult people. And you see that here with Elijah, right? You see difficult people. A difficult person. The second one is, uh, think about this, physical and emotional exhaustion. I mean, Elijah's depressed. Can I just say it? 
Elijah is depressed. He's suicidal. He's saying, God, I can't take my own life, but God, I pray you take my life right now. I'm done. That, that is suicidal. That is depression. That is the ultimate low of lows. And, and I think that many of us, we want to act like it doesn't exist, that it's not real. I've been there. I have been there. And I know many of you have been there as well. I think we need to talk about it. Sometimes it happens because of difficult people. Sometimes it happens because of mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical exhaustion. Think about this. Elijah just climbed this great mountain, guys. He spent all day with these, these fools, watching them make fools of themselves. He spent all day preaching and sharing the truth of who God is. Then he spends time and he builds this altar. He calls fire down from heaven. I'm sorry, but that is one long freaking day. When you're tired, you're tired. Elijah is tired. Uh, maybe another thing that causes us to drop down into that valley is isolation. Isolation. Do you know that we're designed to live in community? We really are. We are designed to be in relationship. But how many of us, out of fear of relationship, drive ourselves away to a place where we isolate ourselves? I mean, that is why we are so adamant about, about community, living the gospel in community. That's why we're so adamant about being in a community, following Jesus together, right? That's why we constantly talk about community groups. Elijah here at this place alone, he's isolated himself. He has nobody to encourage him, nobody to speak into his life, nobody to say, hey, it's going to be okay. And don't think that this is just a whim. Elijah was a strong man. He knew the power of prayer. He called fire down from heaven. He prayed it wouldn't rain for three and a half years. It didn't rain. He prayed that it would rain, and it did rain. Uh, another story we don't have time to share. He uh, prayed for food, I think chapter 17, and God sent birds to feed him. He prayed over a dead boy that came back to life. This is a man that knew the power of prayer. But you see, he lets one person speak into a situation, a difficult person, have influence. He lets the physical and emotional and spiritual exhaustion just wear on him after a long day. Then he isolates himself. And then I would also say that he probably had unrealistic goals. Any of you guys ever set unrealistic goals? I, I do it all the time. I, I can't imagine when Elijah's goals. What do you think his goals are? I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, man, you know, we're going to blow this, this altar up. And man, all these people are going to say, oh, Elijah, you're right. God, we praise you, not these false gods. It doesn't happen. Unrealistic goals. Can you imagine, think about this, some of you guys, the adrenaline rush? Think about the adrenaline rush. Anybody jump out of airplanes? Yeah, there's like a couple. That's like incredible, by the way. I can't imagine. You're just like, oh, yeah. You know, um, anybody like race cars? Legally, <laughs> he's like, oh. um, think of just the adrenaline rush, right, guys? And think about the adrenaline rush Elijah had that day coming off that mountain. He's like, Woo, man, that was a big day. Now she wants to kill me. And there's a fall after an adrenaline rush, guys. I mean, this is all natural, isn't it? Not. He's tired. He's worn out. And look at what happens. God sends an angel. And it, it uh, <clears throat> says, angel of the Lord, which a lot of times... Biblical scholars believe that it was Christ that came. Okay? So you say, well, Jesus didn't exist before 
you know, he came on the scene and like, like uh, you know, when the calendar shifted to you know, BC to AD, you know, it, he's, he's on the scene. He shows up. And you know what he does? I, I love this. I mean, if you were God, what would you do to a guy like Elijah? Dude, just get up. Come on, man. We got work to do. How many of you guys would do that, honestly? You guys are so insensitive. That's okay. I am too. Um, it's like, come on, man. Get up. We got work to do. Did you see what God just did? How many of you guys would ask that question? Did you see what God just did? Think about it. Would you ask that question? Come on. Come on. I know that some of you guys would ask that question. Did you see what God just did? I mean, we, we try to counsel that way, right? We try to say, well, hey, did you see what God did over there? God doesn't do any of that. You know what God does when he shows up? He says, uh, hey, hey, Elijah, um, I got some fresh coffee brewing over here, and I got you a bagel, man. Just, just eat and drink. And so Elijah, he wakes up, he eats and drinks, and God says, hey, are you feeling any better yet? And Elijah says, no, I did this, and God, I did this. And God, did you see, I was so faithful in those three and a half years, God. Did you see that? And, and nobody else wanted to come around and help me, God. I was the only one, God. You told me to run really, really hard, really, really fast, and hide really, really well. And I did that, God. And where did it get me? And, and, and I love, you know, look at the text. What is God's response? Man, dude, uh, may, maybe you should take another nap. <laughs> and it says Elijah goes back to sleep. And then God taps him, you know, hey, man, uh, I got some more coffee here for you, and I, I got another bagel, man. You know, eat and drink. And then he asks him again, and Elijah may be a little bit cooler than last time, but he's, he's still a little bit revved up. He's like, let me tell you something, God. Have you ever done that? Literally, seriously, have you done that? Oh, yes, you have. Oh, yeah, you have done that. Even if it's just quiet in your car, you're driving, you're like, God, why isn't things not going the way I want them to go? God, you know that I am God of my life. You, you've done that. I've done that, guys. Oh, yeah. And, and so God, again, he just, you know, hey, man, just, just, it's okay. Get some more sleep, man. You're exhausted, bro. Get some more sleep. So he goes back to sleep. And then he, tell, he, he gets them up. And, and, and he sends them on a 40-day journey. It would only take him five days to get to the place he was going. But he tells him, take 40 days. Take 40 days. Now, Elijah at this point, he's got to be like the, the main dude on the speaking tour, right? He just called fire down from heaven. Everybody's ringing up his phone and saying, hey, man, we want you to come share this. Hey, man, come tell our people what God did. That was amazing. He sets all that aside. He takes 40 days away from everything. He cleared his schedule. Sometimes, God, guys, I think our struggle is we need to clear our schedules. When we feel like we're getting to a place where some of these things are creeping in, we need to clear our schedules. We need to get some sleep. We need to eat. And then it goes on. And you see... As you read through the context of that scripture, it says, The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain, this is verse 11, in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. So he sleeps in this cave, cave a little bit more, you know, a 40 day journey, sleeps in the cave. God comes and he says, Walk out to the mouth of the cave. He said, The Lord is about to pass by. Then, it, then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, man? Elijah throws a little temper tantrum. And then God gives him some marching orders. You know what he tells him to do? He tells him to go anoint this guy king and go anoint this other guy to help with this. And then he goes, he says, oh yeah, by the way, I've got, uh, 
I've got a, name, a guy named Elisha that I want you to go get. He's just going to be your friend, man. He's just going to be your friend. He's just going to walk with you. He's just going to encourage you. I think you need a friend. And if you continue reading in that context, Elijah goes and he, he gets help. The king is anointed. Another guy has moved into a place. Elijah realizes that there are other people that are following God. God tells him, he's like, hey, you're not the only one. I've got all these other people. Let me encourage you today. You're not the only one. God has all these other people. God has a people right here. You're not the only one. God has people living in groups within our community. You're not the only one. As the band comes up and continues to lead us in worship, I don't want you to tune out yet. I want you to hear this. I think this is extremely important. If you hear nothing else that was said today, I want you to hear this. Please hear this. If you have had that mountaintop drop, if you are in that drop right now, you are one of the lowest states that you've been in for a while. Maybe some of you are still on that mountaintop. I guarantee there is a drop at some point. That's part of life. That's part of what happens when we're exhausted. That's what happens when we find ourselves isolated. That's what happens when we come off of these highs. There's a drop, right? Let me encourage you. What did God do for Elijah? <clears throat> he let Elijah vent, did he not? Oh, Elijah threw a temper tantrum. Man, remind me of my three-year-old. He threw a temper tantrum. And then God told him what? What did he tell him? Go get some sleep. We'll talk later. He gets some sleep, and what does God do? Here, man, get some food. Get some food. You need to eat. And he says, you better yet? Elijah's tantrum is not as big as before, but there's still some tantrum in there. I think you need some more sleep. Get some more sleep. You know what? Take 40 days. Get away. Take 40 days. He tells him to get some more food. And then he tells him this. If you look in the context, guys, what is, what is all the, the wind and the fire and, and all that? That is showing the power of our God. And we need to be reminded of the power of God within our life circumstances and situations. But you know what I love within that power? God speaks through the whisper. Because we also need to know the gentleness of our God. The patience of our God. That our God cares. That our God walks with us. That our God will see us through if we give him the opportunity. And then he tells Elijah, he sends him out. And he says, don't forget where your identity is. Because in those lows, we often forget our identity, don't we? He tells him, he says, don't forget your calling. Elijah, I've called you to greatness. Elijah, I've called you to be involved in the advancement of my kingdom. Elijah, I know that sometimes it's going to be very difficult Elijah, I know that sometimes things are going to come your way that make no sense. Elijah, I understand that sometimes relationships don't go the way you want. Elijah, I understand that sometimes people are, are going to say some things that are just going to be cruel and unusual. Elijah, I understand that sometimes people are not going to move the direction that you know that they should move, and ministry gets hard sometimes, Elijah. I know that. I know, Elijah, that sometimes people are going to hurt you. I know, Elijah, all the distractions that are out there. I know, Elijah, I know all this stuff. I am the one true God. 
I am powerful, but I'm gentle. Get some sleep, get some food, and come follow me. I will restore you. I will heal you. I will help you remember your calling and your identity is forged in me. Let us be reminded of that this day, guys. Whether we're at the mountain or we're in the valley, we're at the mountain or we're at the drop, our identities are forged in Christ. And that is all these things we've been covering through Motivate, these things that are posted on our Facebook page every day for the next 40 days are just little tidbits they are going to help you connect with the God of the universe to solidify ourselves within his power and his gentleness. Let us do that this week, guys, and be reminded of that. Let's do that.